Hi everybody! Welcome back to Bentley House. I'm Ara, and today I'm going to be showing you how I made this 12 scale Hoosier cabinet and I'm going to give you a free pattern so you can make it too. This Hoosier cabinet is in honor of 30,000 subscribers. Thank you guys so much for subscribing. Thank you for sticking around for my comment. Thank you for commenting, subscribing, liking, all those things. They make my channel a place I really enjoy being and I hope you guys enjoy it too. For my 5,000 subscriber special, I made this retro stove, and then for 10,000 subscribers, I made this little ice box to match. And so today we are continuing on with the retro kitchen theme, and that is why I'm creating the Hoosier cabinet. If you're wondering where the subscriber special for 15, 20, and 25 are, well, my channel kind of blew up. Um, over the past month or so, which I am so thankful for, but I just couldn't get a subscriber special out in time for all those that we passed really quickly. So I'm hoping that you feel like this Hoosier cabinet makes up for all of that and you guys really enjoy it. The best place you can find the pattern so you can make one for yourself is in the description box below. You have to push the little arrow and it will open up and I have a JPEG file so you can download that. I have PDF files if it's difficult for you to work with JPEGs and if you're someone with a cutting machine there are SVGs so you can just cut the pieces out on a machine. There are also a few more things you will need along the way but hopefully they are all household items and you won't have to go searching too hard to find everything you need to create this piece. So let's get started. To begin, make sure that you've downloaded all four pages of the pattern. There is one cardstock sheet, and there are three matte board sheets that need to be cut out on matte board material. You can find the directions for making sure that your patterns are sized correctly on the patterns themselves. You may also need a few other things depending on what pieces you decide to add to your Hoosier cabinet. You do not have to do every single thing, but this is a decent list to help you get started. To start construction, I'm going to need both pieces marked A, both pieces marked B, and I'm going to save the two C's and the J for later. These were all from map board sheet one. I'm going to glue one of the pieces marked A onto the other piece. This is going to provide a double thickness and it's going to make our cabinet extra strong. I'm using tacky glue for this and then for each piece that I glue together I want to make sure that I use clamps or put it underneath something heavy. By doing this it makes sure that I know my piece is going to go together smoothly and not have any gaps between the pieces. The pieces that are marked B are going to sandwich on either side of the piece marked A, just like this. I'm going to add glue to the very side of A and then push the B piece up against it, making sure that it is aligned on the top and bottom. For the next step, you need F, G, H, I, two pieces marked O, and this piece that has three openings inside of it. These pieces are all going to create the lower cabinet. I'm going to use F and put it on the very bottom and it should fit snugly between the two pieces marked B and against the back of A. Next I'm going to use piece I and this is going to create the shelf inside the bottom cabinet. I can actually place this piece wherever I want so if you want a shorter shelf at the top you can put it more towards the top. If you want it to evenly divide it in half, then just go ahead and kind of center it in that area. You do want to make sure that it is up against the left side or the left piece marked B. This is going to help you get the correct distance for putting the center wall in the bottom cabinet. So now I've just glued it in and made sure that it was dry. Piece H will actually serve as a dividing wall in the bottom section and it's going to go right up against piece I. So I'm going to add glue to that, glue it against the back of A and make sure that it dries as well. This is going to create the area for my drawers. I'm not gluing this piece on yet but I wanted you to see how the piece I that is your shelf divider will look once the cabinet is all put together. Next, I'm going to use this piece and I'm going to flip it onto the back side. I'm going to take both of the pieces that are marked O and they're going to be glued right underneath the opening and these are going to be the surfaces on which the drawers can slide in and out. 
I want to make sure that I move them a sixteenth of an inch away from the edge to make room for when I put them into the cabinet and I will show you that close up. So as you can see these panels are a sixteenth inch away from the edge glued right underneath the opening in both areas. Now I'm also going to take piece G and I'm going to glue it again a sixteenth inch away from either side of that opening and this is on the back just like the pieces that were marked O. I'm going to glue that right up against the top edge so that I have a top part of my cabinet. I'm going to let that completely dry trying to make sure that everything is as perpendicular as possible. And side note, if you see a little gunk on my pieces, that is laser stuff from my laser cutter. So that's why they look a little dirty. This piece is going to be pushed into the piece you already made and it should line up correctly so that the front piece that has the three openings sits firmly on the front of the pieces marked B and also on F that made up your bottom piece. Once I know that it fits correctly, I'm going to go ahead and add glue to all the surfaces that are going to touch and then carefully slide it back into place, making sure all my surfaces are as straight as possible. Now I'm going to be using the pieces L and two pieces marked C. C is very easy to line up. You want to make sure that it lines up with this corner. So the corner of C should also line up with this little jut out corner along the piece marked B. I'm going to glue that in on both sides. This is going to create a surface for me to carefully slide in the piece L underneath the pieces marked C. This is creating a gap between the top of the lower cabinet and the L piece. And this is important because it's going to help us create our slide out surface for the Hoosier cabinet. Once I know it fits correctly, I'm going to add glue and carefully insert it so that it's correctly positioned under both pieces marked C. This will give you this nice little gap here right above the lower cabinet. Now I'm going to need both pieces marked D, piece E, piece J, and K, and then this piece that has two openings. This is going to create everything you need for the upper cabinet. First, I'm going to glue the two pieces marked D together, and I want to make sure that that hole in the center is lined up for the future. Once D is glued together, I'm going to go ahead and add glue to all three sides, leaving the front side without glue. I'm going to slide it in right on top of both of the pieces that were marked C. Just like in the lower cabinet, we have one shelf in the upper cabinet. K is going to create that shelf, so wherever you want to place it within the upper cabinet, you can do that. And I'm just, again, going to try and center it as best as possible and make sure the shelf is as straight as possible. Now I can use J for my center partition, which is going to help create the cabinet on the left. I'm going to glue that in and make sure that it is as straight as possible and let it dry. Now I can use E to create the very top of my cabinet. It should sit right on top of piece J and in between the two side pieces that are marked B. I'm gonna go ahead and glue that in, making sure it is straight as possible. Now that I have the interior of the upper cabinet assembled, I can add the front of the cabinet on, which is the piece that has the two openings in it. I want to make sure and line that up so that the smaller opening is on the left of the cabinet. This piece should fit perfectly on top of those little jut out corners that were on the piece marked B. And this is our construction so far. Now we're going to move on to creating the drawers. For the bottom drawer, you need the pieces with a double V, W, two pieces with a single V, and the piece marked S. I'm going to start with the double V piece, and I'm going to grab W, and I'm going to glue the W piece to the top of the very back of the piece with the double V. This is what it looks like. It's a lot of letters and it sounds complicated, but it goes together pretty simply. Now I'm going to add both pieces marked V on either side, making sure that it juts up against piece W on the back. Now I should be able to glue it to the back of piece S 
and I just want to make sure that there is a 16th inch all the way around and it is centered on the back of this piece. This is what's going to create our drawer front. Once it's glued together, I'm going to set it aside to dry. The upper drawer goes together in much the same way. It just has different letters so you know which pieces go with which drawer. If you have any issues getting your drawers into the piece, just sand a little bit and it should slide in pretty easily. To create the upper drawer, I'm going to glue the piece marked U to the back of the piece with a double T. And then I'm going to do the side panels with the pieces marked T with a single T. And then again, I'm going to center it on the back of the piece marked R, which makes the drawer front. And there you should have two finished drawers ready to be put into your cabinet. Make sure to wait until they are dry before you put them into your cabinet so you don't accidentally glue them to the cabinet. If you don't want to make drawers that pull out, you can just glue the drawer fronts straight onto the cabinet opening. Now I'm going to be working on the doors, and so X, Y, and Z create the doors for the top cabinet, and Q creates the door for the bottom cabinet. The other pieces you see here are going to be glued onto these pieces to create kind of a stair step effect. This is what's going to allow your cabinet door to fit snugly in the opening. So M1 needs to be glued on top of X, M2 needs to be glued on top of Y, M3 needs to be glued on top of Z, and then N needs to be glued on top of Q. And eventually you will get a bunch of these little pieces. Now for M2 and M3, they need to be glued so that they are against one side, and this is because this is a double opening cabinet, so those pieces need to meet in the middle. Everything else should be completely centered. After you have those constructed, you can make sure that they fit correctly in your cabinet and they should just pop in because they were actually the pieces that you cut out of the center of these openings. In the pattern, they're already in the center of the openings, so they should fit perfectly. If you have a hard time getting them in, you may just wanna sand down the sides just a little bit. Now I'm gonna be working on the leg pieces. On the pattern, the small pieces have an E next to them, a lowercase e, and the larger pieces have a lowercase d. Each leg is going to consist of an E piece and a D piece, and you're going to glue E to the back of D to create a kind of 90 degree angle leg that looks like this. You're going to do that for each leg and then carefully glue it onto the bottom of your piece. I glued it just sitting a little bit in, so a 16th inch from the edge, but you can glue it right onto the edge if you would like, it's up to you. If you decide that you want a Hoosier cabinet that is a little bit taller, I think the work table height on this one is about sitting height, you can add longer legs using some wood. Now I'm going to create the sliding piece that comes out and is your work table top. This consists of two pieces that are marked P. I glue them together and clamp them and they should fit perfectly in the gap we created earlier and it should slide in and out smoothly. If it doesn't, just take some sandpaper and sand down the sides until it works for you. Now we're gonna be adding some details by using the pieces on the cardstock sheet. This large square should fit perfectly on the lower part of piece B, and this long rectangle that has a line in the middle should fit on top of piece B on the like upper part of the cabinet. To make sure that these pieces sit flat, I want to sand down any edges that are sticking out, and then I want to add glue all to the back, like all over the back of the piece. Uh, not too much glue so that it is like squirting out, but enough so that each section of the cardstock is firmly adhered to the mat board. If you don't get enough glue on there, it could warp while you are painting the piece. If it does warp, just be patient. Sometimes the warp will go away within a couple hours. Now I've glued both pieces. You can see I have a little edge on the front of mine. I do fix that in the file later, so yours should fit perfectly on your piece. 
I also have pieces that correspond with the cabinets. Make sure you lay them out so that you have the correct cardstock decoration piece to go on the correct uh, cabinet door. They should all fit perfectly. And then I'm just going to use my sandpaper on the edge to make sure any remaining cardstock that's sticking over the edge of the cabinet doors comes off. I'm doing that for all the edges where cardstock has been applied to mat board. Make sure and sand away from the edge, not towards the edge, because then it could pull the cardstock up. And this is how it is looking so far with the cardstock pieces added. Now it is time to paint, which is the exciting time. I feel like that's when the piece really starts to come alive. I am of course going with brown, and uh, this is not just because I like brown and like wood furniture. Most Hoosier cabinets, or a lot of Hoosier cabinets, at least were originally uh, had a wood finish on it. And I wish I had done a little bit of a lighter wood finish to be more accurate. This one ends up pretty dark, but um, I do try to come up with a way to give it some wood grain, which I will show you. I first did a initial layer of just base brown paint, and now I'm going to use a very not high quality watercolor brush, which they're only really good for like adding texture, so I like to save them for that. I'm going to get a lighter color and I'm going to carefully drag it down the side of my cabinet in the direction that I want my wood grain to be. At first this doesn't give me a lot of control, but I soon figure out that I can apply the paint and then force the long streaks with my finger by pulling it down the side of the cabinet. I do this all over the cabinet in many different areas, trying to think of which direction the wood grain would probably be going if this cabinet was actually made of wood. I also decided to try and lighten up the wood by using some chalk pastel. This is just grated or shaved, there we go, shaved chalk pastel, and I used kind of an orangey color because I felt a lot of the reference photos I was looking at had a lot of orange tint. I don't know if that was the finish they used on the cabinet, but I decided to add a little bit of that orangeness, and I think it also added a lot of age to this piece, which of course I really, really like. I also used black shaved chalk pastel in the corners and this is going to make it look as though it's been used for several years and the age has built up over time in the corners that are hard to clean. I'm also going to add some of this black around the edges of the cabinet and I think this is really going to help the doors stand out because everything's the same color. Sometimes the doors and that kind of detailing will get lost. And so this is how it ends up after I add some of the black. I also added it where the handles will be on the drawers because that's a part of the furniture that will get touched quite a bit. I have not painted the work surface yet. Uh, I still hadn't decided what color I wanted it to be. Now it's time to create the iconic flower bin. Uh, I'm going to need two pieces marked H, two pieces marked I, one piece marked J, and then on your pattern there are two long pieces with a lowercase f, and then two shorter pieces with a lowercase g. You're going to need all of those for the flower bin. You're going to start putting it together by gluing both pieces marked H to the back of one of the I pieces, making sure to line it up against the top of the piece and then you can finish it off. It's going to be like a square polygon shape. <laughs> and uh, so both of the H's are sandwiched between the I's, making sure that the tops all line up. The I's will stick out a little bit below the H's, but that's okay because it makes room for J. J should fit perfectly between the eyes and sit on top of the bottom of the H pieces, so I'm just going to use a little bit of tacky glue and glue that in. Because this is not a working flower bin, it doesn't matter that there's not an opening on the bottom. We will fake that later. Now I'm going to use the longer pieces that were marked with a lower case F, and I'm going to add glue to either sides to add the, the smaller, shorter G pieces. I'm starting to get tongue-tied a little bit. We'll make it through, I promise. 
This is just like the flower bin. I'm going to sandwich both pieces that were marked with the lowercase g between the pieces that were marked with the lowercase f to create a little frame that's going to sit on top of our flower bin. Once the flower bin has dried, I'm going to gently sand it on sandpaper so that the top is as flat as possible. There is a little bit of an angle when you put it together, so sanding it down makes sure that the frame we created sits perfectly on top. So just keep sanding until you're happy with how flat it is. Once it is how you like it, you're going to add a little bit more tacky glue and then glue the frame on top. Now you have your completed flower bin, except for the little nozzle and handle. We're working with pieces now that are from the cardstock page. You're going to need these two one inch pieces, this three and a half inch long piece, and then this really long piece that has like a angle to it a little bit. And you're going to need one Q-tip or cotton swab, depending what you call it. I cut the ends off my cotton swab to make it a little easier to work with. The first and easiest thing we're going to create are the side brackets that are characteristic of most Hoosier cabinets. I'm going to lay the piece over the Q-tip and then push down the sides to make this kind of U-shape. And this is what's going to create a side bracket that looks like it's connecting the upper and lower part of the cabinet. I'm going to make two of these, one for each side of the cabinet. I'm gonna put those aside and grab the very long piece that we're going to roll up to make the bottom of the flower bin. We are going to roll from the thicker side to the thinnest side, making sure that we line up the long flat side as we go. I'm using the Q-tip as a rolling guide, but I'm not going to glue this piece to the Q-tip. So once I get it started, I'm going to add glue to a piece that's not going to touch the Q-tip. So once I start rolling it, it will grab hold of itself and I will be able to use to remove the Q-tip piece later. Then I'm just going to slowly and calmly <laughs> Rolling paper is one of those things that can be frustrating, but if you go slowly and add glue along the way, I find it much less frustrating. I just wanna make sure that I'm lining that straight edge up the entire way I go, which means one side will slowly, slowly start to get smaller as you go along, creating a cone shape, and um, this will create the nozzle for our flower bin. Once I take it off the Q-tip and while the glue is still drying, I'm just going to flatten it on the side that's supposed to be flat so that it is as flat as possible. To add it to the flower bin, I'm just going to put glue on the flat side and then glue it to the bottom of the bin we previously created. Making sure that it's centered, <laughs> of course. Now we mostly have it done in a few minutes, I will make the handle to go with it. But before we get there, let's make the rolling pin, which I have seen added on many of the Hoosier cabinets. So this is just a fun little extra detail if you'd like to create it. You're gonna take your three and a half inch long rectangle and put some glue on the Q-tip and then put it on one end of the rectangle, letting it dry as much as possible and then start rolling it. You wanna make sure that you are rolling this very tightly so that you don't, so that it looks like a solid piece because if you don't roll it very tightly, it'll look kind of coiled and like paper, but you wanna roll it pretty straight and pretty tight, adding glue as you go. Then you should have something that resembles a little rolling pin. And then I'm just going to measure a quarter inch on either side and then cut off the Q-tip piece to create my rolling pin handles. Now we're finally ready for the handle for the flower bin. I'm using a paper clip and then a another piece of paper that's about an inch by a quarter inch, and I'm going to roll it just like we did the rolling pin, but on the very end of the paper clip, I'm going to roll it up and glue it as I go. And then I'm just going to use my pliers to turn the handle to create an L shape, and then I'm going to again turn it the other way so that it ends up in a Z shape, like a flattened out Z, but with 90, 90 degree angles. Then I should have a handle and then I can chop off one edge and of course send it flying across my workroom. 
This is my completed handle for the flower bin and it is now ready to paint. And if you've gotten this far, congratulations for getting through all the paper rolling bits. I know that's not the most fun. I am going to be painting the handle and the rolling pin with a light cream color. And of course, this is where you can get really creative and make your own design, whatever you want to highlight. If you want a rolling pin that sticks out, you could maybe use pink, who knows? For the brackets and the flower bin, I am going to use a base coat of gray and then a top coat of metallic silver so that it shines and looks like metal. Once those are all completed, I'm going to take my flower bin handle, add a little bit of super glue and glue it as if the handle is coming out of the center of the nozzle. Here it is completed. Also, the brackets that I painted silver are ready to be added to the cabinet. I'm just going to add it right along the line that was created with the two pieces of cardstock. This is going to make it look like the attached cabinet or the upper cabinet is now attached to the bottom cabinet via the brackets. I'm using a sharp tool to make little indentions to look like nail holes. I'm now adding the flower bin to the underside of the cabinet on top, and usually it's aligned underneath the left side cabinet that's very open. One of the details I decided I wanted to add was the jar holder. What you're gonna need is the little wheel with the circle cutouts, and then the two pieces that are marked with a lowercase a. You wanna glue the two lowercase a pieces together to create this square dowel, and then that piece should fit in the center square opening in the middle of the round jar holder. I then use the same technique I did previously to paint it silver. For this part, I wanted to come up with an easy way for everybody to make the mason jars. Um, so if you didn't have resin or you didn't have mold putty, you could still create the mason jars and have it look like mason jars. So I'm using a skinny stick of hot glue and I'm cutting off half inch pieces from the hot glue stick. The pieces that were cut out of the center of the jar holder are going to serve as the lids for the hot glue jars. So here I have six pieces cut off. Now they do look really square. I tried to round them off with my craft blade and they came out a little chunky. So if you come up with a way to round the hot glue, that would be amazing. Let us all know because I think it would give it just that little extra bit of realism. I painted the caps a flat gray and then glued them on top of the hot glue pieces, creating this little faux jar. Each piece should fit inside the little circles and I'm going to use some tacky glue to tack them in place to make sure that they are all sitting at about the same height. Later on, I will use a little bit of super glue once they're all at the height I like. Using the tacky glue at first allows me to put it onto my work surface and make sure that they are all sitting at the same level. The two pieces that hold the rolling pin in place are marked with a lowercase c on your pattern, and all I'm going to do to those is paint them the same brown as the cabinet. To install the jar holder, I need to make sure and locate the hole that's in the pieces that were marked D. And the easiest way I found to do this is to use some gel super glue, add that to the hole in the cabinet, and just let it sit there. And then I am going to add tacky glue to the upper part of the jar holder stem. I guess we'll call it a stem. And then once I insert that in place, the tacky glue and the super glue have some sort of like reaction where they take hold really quickly. I do add a little bit more super glue once it takes hold, but within 10 seconds, it should hold enough to hold its own weight and then just let it dry for a little bit and that's the easiest way I found to do it. To install the rolling pin holders, I just added one side with tacky glue, and then I'm going to put the rolling pin on the surface, not on the holder itself, on the surface, and measure out how far I need to add the other one so that the rolling pin fits comfortably in place. I am gluing my rolling pin in place because I don't want to lose it and I can't imagine that I would pull it out at any point, but I'm just going to add some glue to the handles and then gently set it on top of the holders 
and let it all dry thoroughly. And this is how it is looking so far. I really like this little center area. I think it gives this piece a lot of interest. Now it's time to work on the hardware, which is my least favorite part. You're gonna need all these little circles from the mat board piece, some sewing pins, and then you're also going to need to locate the holes that were pre-located on the drawers. And you can use, um, like my laser cut these, but you can use a little hand drill for these. And then you will be able to insert the sewing pins into the drawers. I'm also going to need to do the hand drill bit myself on the cabinets because I did not do those with the laser. So I found a little drill piece that was about the same width as the sewing pin and I made a hole and the sewing pin fits right in there. I also want to make sure that I put the holes in the correct place so I lay out my cabinets so I know where I want my handles to be. And I do that for each cabinet so each cabinet has one handle. Once I have it in the hole, I can measure out how deep I want my handles to be and then cut off the end of the sewing pin. To do this, I have one end like pop off into a container and then I hold the sharp end in my hand. This keeps the sewing pins from going across the room and losing a sewing pin in your room. I'm going to need six of these, I think. And to create these, I'm going to be doubling up the circles. And so each circle is consisting of two mat board pieces. I'm going to add a little bit of tacky glue to the back of the circle. And then I'm going to add a little bit of super glue to the head of the pin. And then once I put the pin on top of the circle, it should pretty instantly connect. And then I have a little drawer pull. I reinserted them into the holes to see if I like the length. I do end up cutting them a little bit shorter and then I paint them silver like I have some of the other pieces. And now you can see that the handles fit in the doors and I think they look pretty cool. Now I need to work on the hinges which are probably my least favorite part. I was going to do some hinges similar to the ice box, but I just couldn't put myself through that again. And I knew that if you had created this piece, you probably don't want to go through that again. So I decided to go with a much simpler idea using fabric to reinforce some of the cardstock pieces. So I did find in my research that these butterfly hinges are specifically associated with Hoosier cabinets, so I thought it was really cool to use these. So in order to reinforce the cardstock, I'm first going to glue each piece to some cotton fabric. And I chose brown because it's the same color as my cabinet, so if you can see a little bit of the fabric, it just blends in with the cabinet itself. Once all the pieces are glued, I'm going to carefully, with fabric scissors, cut any excess fabric that's sticking out outside of the perimeter of the cardstock. I even used my X-Acto knife to get little, the little in-between spots. Make sure that these are as clean as possible. Once they're done, they look like this, where it's cardstock on one side and fabric on the other. I'm going to pick the cardstock silver, and then it should create a little hinge that looks like this. To create the bins in the correct place, I just put it on top of the cabinet door and then push with my fingernail until it bends into a Z shape. Please make note that I am shaping the hinges on the cabinet, but when I glue them, I am going to be taking the doors off of the cabinet so they don't accidentally glue the doors to the cabinet itself. So in this uh, little clip here, I am using tacky glue to attach the hinges to the door, but I highly, 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 highly suggest super glue. My hinges started coming off and it didn't like rip up the paint or anything. It's just like the tacky glue did not want to stick and be used as a hinge. So definitely whenever you glue the hinges on, use super glue and that will save you a lot of frustration. Once my hinges are glued to the door in the correct spots, I am going to then add the door onto my cabinet and carefully glue the hinges to the cabinet itself. And I'm using my same trick of using something very pointed to create what looks like little nail holes. 
As you can see, these hinges turned out a little less bulky, which I appreciate, but they still didn't look quite right as hinges. So I'm taking some of those leftover bits from the sewing pins, I'm cutting off a tiny section that's about as long as my hinge, and then I'm just super gluing it to the very top edge of the hinge. And my goodness, do I need a manicure after this project. <laughs> but it creates the hinge that looks, it looks like the little barrel of the hinge. So I really like how that turned out. Now I'm finally painting my work surface and I decided to paint it about the same color as the rolling pin and the handle. I thought that would really flow nicely. And once you paint it, you may want to sand it down because you want to make sure that the whole thing is sliding very smoothly. I put my paint on a little too fast so the work surface curved a little bit. So what you want to do is do your paint in like smaller thinner coats and then it won't warp like mine did. Then I added a little bit of a glossy shine to make it look like an enameled surface and here is the final result. Oh and I also added that silver border to give it a little bit of an interest. So that's it for how the Hoosier cabinet goes together. I think it could be personalized in so many different ways to fit each individual style. I hope if you do create it that you would share it with me on my Instagram at Bentley House Minis. I would love to see what you guys create. Some of you may know that I have started making kits of some of my designs. The first one, this one, was released a couple weeks ago and is now currently available in my store. And you might be wondering, am I going to make a kit for the Hoosier cabinet. Yes, I am. However, it does take me a good solid week for me to do all of the quality control to make sure the kit is absolutely perfect before it goes out to you. The best way for you to stay up to date on whether or not the kit is available is to be on my email list, which you can find the link below to sign up. You do have to be 16 years or older to sign up. You can also be a part of my Facebook page, which you can find the link below for that. Also, if you're interested, my patrons also know about kits ahead of time, and they do get a discount code for being one of my patrons. All my kits are hand cut by me, well, not hand cut, they're laser cut by me in my studio. So everything you will see in my store is a pre-order, which means it'll take seven to 10 business days for me to process your order, get everything cut and packaged and sent to you. This helps me save from using extra materials that I don't need to use because people don't particularly want that kit. Um, so it just helps on saving materials and it just is a little extra wait time for you guys, but I hope that's okay. Thanks so much for following along today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you want to see me make another subscriber special, be sure to subscribe. Make sure you're subscribed below. Share this video so we can reach the next subscriber milestone. Oh, and also leave me an idea of what else I need to create to continue with our vintage retro kitchen set. So we have a stove, we have a fridge, we have a cabinet. What else needs to go with this? You guys have the best ideas. The Hoosier cabinet was actually suggested in the last in the icebox video. So um, I want to hear from you guys. Leave me a comment below and I'll start doing some research and thinking ahead for that next subscriber special. I hope you guys have an amazing week and I will see you in the next one. Bye.